Hi friends! My name is Shinru. I'm a music and computer science student at Brown University and I have ADHD and dyslexia. In this video I'm going to talk about how I see us with my disabilities and hopefully that will help you as well. I'm going to touch a bit on my personal experiences, talk about my approach to both coding, school, and recruiting, and finally give you some unsolicited, unsolicited advice that I wish I would have known about two years ago. I have 10 very concrete things that you can start doing right now, so let's get started! Part zero! So before I even say anything about how I overcame my disability or can totally give legitimate advice, I'm gonna say that CS is really, really hard and I struggle and quit for a year and I take up to this day I take all of my classes past fail and and it's okay. So, so whatever imposter syndrome you're feeling right now, your feelings are completely legitimate, but you're probably also doing a lot better than you think you are doing. If someone hasn't told you today, you're doing great! Action number one, figuring out your disability. <laughs> I feel like this should be a given, but every version of every disability looks almost completely different. And even understanding how your disability affects your day-to-day -day life can translate really well to figuring out what can help you when you code. From my personal experiences, having not been diagnosed until after my first CS class, I struggled a lot with even figuring out whether or not my disabilities were real things. And instead of thinking, oh, maybe this is a problem that I should get look at, I would just shut off and think, oh, this is because I'm really stupid and I can't do anything and everyone else is smarter than me. And that is totally not true. Figure out what about CS is making you struggle and whether or not that is directly related to the content of CS where that could be affected by something else. This sounds easy, but I promise you it's really, really hard. So I'm just going to give two examples about how how that affects me. For example, with my dyslexia, it's really hard for me to just read code. And whatever fonts terminals use, it is a crime to humanity. It looks like gibberish, but I can change that by just simply changing the font of the thing I'm coding in. There are also much less obvious triggers to disabilities. So for example, with my dyslexia, the concept of syntax simply does not make sense to me. And that was really hard for me to define my freshman year because to realize I don't understand syntax, I have to first understand syntax. That is a lot harder to separate from the CS itself, but you can still kind of make it work. The same thing goes for ADHD, it's mostly my issues with executive functioning, which does not directly correlate to how I code, but it does correlate to how much I put effort into coding and how that affects my ability to do my assignments and code and do everything right. So literally before we get started, figure out what your disability is, how it affects you when you're not coding, and how that might translate when you are coding. You won't have a solution, but now you have the problem you asked yourself to go look for the solution which I know is very frustrating, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I do it. Number two, user interface changes. A very, very important word to know here is IDE. It stands for Integrated Inter Integrated Development Environment. It's something you enter your code into to make the code code. Um, things like Atom, Eclipse, Google Colab, Microsoft Visual Studio. And very often, it's actually possible to customize your IDE so that it's enough formatting that makes it easier for you to code. I personally have a favorite IDE and it is Microsoft Visual Studio Code. I change it to a dark background with a light pastel on top and I use the font Open Dyslexic. I make the font larger than it's supposed to be and then I have a bigger spacing and it all makes it slightly easier for me to code. And the other things I love about Visual Studio Code is that um, one, it can auto-complete your code for you. It's almost like spelling. And two, if you highlight one word, it highlights everything else on the page that has the exact same spelling. Super, super helpful for me. And obviously, whatever user experience or interface that works best for you, you can customize it according to what you need. All you have to look up is just like how to change Visual Studio Code to have Comic Sans or whatever it is that you need. Number three, break down your code aka what your teachers tell you to do, but you probably don't do. It's actually super, super helpful. So for me, with my ADHD, I either do everything all at once or never do it. And with very large coding assignments, that just means that I will procrastinate forever and ever and ever and ever because coding Tetris from scratch is so scary and hard. So instead of doing that, you break down the assignment into smaller parts until it feels like you're doing one 30 minute chunk at a time and each of that is a separate assignment. Like when? Get the screen to show up and then make one piece. Make all the shapes. <laughs> make the shapes be able to move. Make the shapes be able to rotate. Make the shapes fall down according to time. Make the shapes fall down according to the rules of the game. Make the shapes clear. Fix the other stuff. And that makes it a lot less intimidating to get started. I do also have the issue of if I know what to do next, then I will either do it or don't do it. So if I'm really hyper-focused, I would do it all at once, which is basically how I lost my vision for a week coding the entirety of Tetris between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. But <laughs> I still did it. So the other thing is if you have the type of ADHD that hyper focuses, please take breaks. Losing your vision and carpet tunnel are all very real things. Avoiding them is probably a best practice. Three, number four, system print lines. So that's the thing that shows up 
in your terminal after you run your code. This is a really great way for me to feel like I'm still doing something even though my code is not perfect and doesn't completely work. It makes it feel easier for me to actually do the ins entire assignment. I also love adding just like positive affirmations in my print lines like you're doing great or, or this is kind of working. <laughs> So then my computer tells me that when I get really frustrated. And the other really great thing about system print lines is, is if you're running models that take a really long time to train and then you get distracted and go like figure out how to- Oh wait, I made this. Isn't this cool? That's exactly what I said not to do, but I also made this while waiting for my model to train and then realizing that I finished training but got really into making this so never did my assignment. So another really great thing about system print lines is that it keeps me engaged and not run off and do something else. Number five! No, that's a ten. Number five! Um, keep a list of running errors that you have that no one else has in your head. Or write it down. Actually, writing it down is probably better. So for example, with my ADHD and dyslexia, my common errors are I spell commands and variables wrong all the time. If a function is looking for multiple arguments, I would flip the order of the arguments. And for while loops, I never close them. So just make a running list of these stupid mistakes. And if your code is not working, just try to look for them first before you get really frustrated. Again, that's a lot easier said than being done. Outside of the coding itself, there's also a lot of outside support things that you can do to make coding easier for you. To be honest, I feel like this is the part that I'm the worst at. I'm not sure if ADHD, dyslexia, imposter syndrome is a thing, but if it is, I definitely have it. Like, I always feel like my ADHD and dyslexia is like not legitimate enough, or like I made it up, or like people have it worse than me so I should not be complaining, or like because of independence, I should not be asking for help because that is just a sign of weakness. And that is not true! I think you're literally legally allowed to ask for help by the Americans with Disability Act. So your disabilities are totally valid and you're totally allowed to ask for help. With that being said, number six, if you're not diagnosed yet, please get diagnosed. See if your school or insurance is willing to pay for it. You'll have get a literal piece of paper that says you're valid because we love outside affirmation. And you'll also get to learn about yourself a lot more because you'll literally be talking to a professional who knows all about your brain. Once you're diagnosed, reach out to your professors for a short chat. This is the email template that I use. Things that I found really helpful to ask for is extended time to on assignments and permission or um, help with setting up a net to code in a separate space away from everyone else. Because that's not a problem anymore in COVID. Number eight. So once you start looking for internships, you're gonna realize that the process is really hard. First of all, you're doing great. It's really hard for everyone. But there are a few things that you can ask for help. For example, it's very easy to ask for permissions to get extended time on coding assessments. Here's a template I use. I was really scared to email them about this past fall, but out of the 10 people I emailed, I thought it got back to me, they all said yes. I wound up only doing half because ADHD, but they were all super super nice about it. If they have an email specifically for accessibility, you can always reach out to them and see what types of other support they give to other applicants with your similar issues. Number nine, it's possible to see us without CS. Yeah, that does not make sense, but hear me out. So in terms of academia, my CS degree is actually half math classes because I realized that in a lot of like the fine print of CS degrees, proof-based math classes can be counted to replace some CS classes because it requires very similar types of thought, but you do not have to deal with a computer that does not understand the concept of a typo. And therefore you are much more likely to pass these. So it's basically doing a um, dyslexic-friendly version of CS. Maybe that's a brown thing. Also, if you just really don't like to code but still want to be in tech and still want to do CS, you still can do that. There are so many jobs in the industry where you'll be working directly with software engineers and building really really cool things that doesn't require actual coding. Um, there are things called program managers, product managers, technical program managers, data scientists, data analysts, probably other job titles that I will put on the screen right here that all exist and they're all really really cool. And the other thing is you don't even have to study CS or even be remotely good at CS to have one of these jobs. For example, my freshman summer, after exactly one CS class and declaring I will never do CS ever again, I actually got to work in a data science internship with a nonprofit that I cared a lot about, applying as a music major. So be happy to talk about this more in a different video, but very often uh, the ability to CS is not so much like, oh, I have a degree in this. It's your willingness to go figure out how to build something and whether or not you can work with the people on the team to build that really, really cool thing. And neither of those are CS requirements. They're just like regular human being requirements. So you don't even have to like even be good at tech to tech. So I feel like that's something you should know as well. Number 10. I feel like this is the most underrated and most helpful thing of all that I did is finding support groups. Being with a community of people that like, that kind of gets you really, really does help. 
I definitely would not be continuing seeing us if it's not for my friends and just everyone else involved in my life that is a part of my weird fascination with CS. But here I am because of these amazing support groups that I'm in. A few really good places to start looking for support groups is one, looking at your school, seeing if there are any women in CS, student accessibility groups, mentorship programs. It's really helpful to ask for a mentor who had similar experiences with invisible disabilities as me and got paired with an amazing mentor. There are also really, really incredible nonprofits like Rewriting the Code, Lime Connect, that connects people with disabilities or women in these really big networks. And there are also professional development programs like the Goldman Sachs Diverse Abilities Program, the Microsoft Diversity Summit, and a lot of other things. I personally find those kind of scary because it's full of people who like have your problem but hasn't figured it out. <laughs> but it's also really, really empowering to see that maybe one of these days you'll also figure it out. Well, you made it to the end of the video, so you did it! Yay! This is the type of content that I wish I saw when I quit CS two years ago, so I basically just made something that I wanted young me to see. Yes, I am not conceited at all, guys. <laughs> and I also want to let you know that if you're struggling right now, you're totally valid. Everyone struggles in CS, but I think that's like literally the culture at this point, and you're doing great. And sometimes it's really discouraging realizing that everyone around you is not experiencing your struggles the same with as you are and it's really challenging. But you're also learning and growing so much from it. And you're so incredible for just choosing this path and going the extra mile every single day to make it happen. And everything, anything you do or choose to do is super, super valid. Um, and thank you so much for watching until the end of this video. If you want to share your experiences or other things that I didn't mention that helped you in the comments, that would be really incredible. I think after I read more comments and talk to more people, I'm going to put together a more physical guide as well. So there's both a video version and a non-written version. And thank you so much again, and I'll see you next time! If I see us, I'm totally qualified to give advice.